Hello everyone, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. Today's video is going to be on the oh-so-scandalous topic of red-shouldered hawks in falconry. This is a subject that I have had many of you constantly remind me that you would like me to do a video on this. And I'm finally getting around to doing it. It's a subject I feel quite strongly about and uh, I'm hoping to do it some justice. Now, normally this, uh, this species, you'll hear two extremes. You'll hear people say, you know, oh, what a fascinating species. I would really love to try one out. And you hear the other extreme of people like, there's no way you can successfully find, they're worthless, blah, 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 blah. And there's these two extremes. So I want to talk about the species. I want to talk about positive attributes and also talk about negative attributes and kind of leave it up to you to decide and give you my spin on things. But this is a species that really is a cool, unique species. To be fair, I want to be full disclosure on this. I have never hunted with a red-shouldered hawk. It's one of the reasons why I've uh, hesitated to make this video. I have worked with them in, in, in uh, rehabilitation and education and, and seen them extensively in the wild, watch how they work. And I know other people who have used them in education and who have successfully used them in falconry. But I have not uh, used one as a falconry bird. So you might say, well, how can you weigh in on this? Well, falconers are rather opinionated. And in all fairness, most of the people who are the naysayers who are most anti-red-shouldered use in falconry also have never attempted to fly one. It is good to keep an open mind in falconry. It is a very good thing. Uh, so with that in mind, you got to think about American falconry, especially United States falconry, is very strange because it has no history. It's, it's oh, oh, we're going, falconry's a thing, let's do it. That's what American falconry is, pure, stupid, and brilliant all at the same time. Almost every other country in the world has some level of history in the sport of falconry. And there are traditions where the landscape, the usage, the prey availability shaped what it is. For example, in Mongolia, you mostly see uh, saker falcons and golden eagles hunted. Hunting a kestrel there would not make a lot of sense. You could. There are kestrels in Mongolia, but it's like, why? Uh, every region kind of has, seems like, you know, hunting peregrines on red grouse in England and Scotland is very, you know, fancy, wonderful, high caliber falconry. And why would you use a member of the buzzard family, the Budio family, like a, a, like a common buzzard? It wouldn't make sense over there, uh, traditionally. And so these traditions, as falconry is sort of a trade, it was like blacksmithing, you know, master apprentice sort of thing, as these traditions were passed down in different regions, uh, they shaped which species were and weren't flown. I mean, like even most Middle Eastern countries fly almost exclusively large, large, beautiful falcons. And they don't even touch hawks. It's like, why would we go after hawks? We're hunting bustards with falcons. Why would we use a hawk or an eagle? Doesn't make sense. America didn't have that. And so in its infancy, American falconry tried out a lot of crazy things that wouldn't be done in other countries, like trying to actually actively pursue game with owls, or the, the biggest success would of course be the Harris Hawks. America and falconers said, well, here's this broad wing kind of gangly bird, but we think it has a lot of potential. Let's try them out. So who's to say we can't? We did, and now Harris Hawk falconry has altered falconry all over the world. It's been adopted as a wonderful thing. So it's always good to keep your mind open. If you go through my videos, if you follow my channel, if you go down the playlist, if you want an extreme example, watch my uh, video on flying harriers in falconry. And that's in my mind about as extreme as you can get at pushing the envelope of falconry in strange birds that seem like they wouldn't be good for the sport. Keep an open mind. It's wise to keep an open mind. Uh, 
Kestrels are a wonderful example of this. Kestrels, American kestrels, tiny birds, tiny feet. They mostly hunt insects. They hunt rodents. They will hunt birds occasionally in the wild. Uh, they don't have long pursuit abilities. And and uh, the old world kestrels were traditionally viewed as like, ah, they're not gamey enough. We're not going to use them. And But American falconers had them available. And so we've, with digital scales where we can fine tune the weight management, uh, kestrels have been proven to be serviceable hunting birds. They're never going to be a merlin. They're never going to be a peregrine. But they're not trying to be. You can still successfully hunt with a kestrel. And that of all the species I see in the United States, that is a species I see being used more and more and more. Never would have guessed that 30, 40 years ago. Certainly wouldn't have guessed it from another country a thousand years ago. So keep an open mind. And, uh, and I'll, I'll try to do justice to address both the negative and the positive on this species. The red-shouldered hawk itself is usually a very colorful bird. It is gorgeous. The name is stupid, red-shouldered hawk, because its shoulder isn't red, its wrist is red. But red-wristed hawk seems kind of silly. That region uh, on the wing folded up is in bird uh, identification terms called the shoulder, even though it's the wrist. They don't get those bright, intense red colors until they are over one year old. But they always have the really uh, well-defined banded tail. They're definitely not stripes. They're intense black, white, black, white bands. And they do become more defined as an adult bird, but they're there and noticeable in a first year or passage bird as well. If you're not familiar with uh, a lot of the vocabulary used in bird watching and biology and falconry, uh, the the red-shouldered hawk is a member of the Budio family. The Budios are the soaring hawks. The quintessential example of a Budio would be the red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are just giant football-shaped birds sitting on telephone poles, sitting on trees, just kind of looking around, typically looking for a rodent to just dive down on. It's like a watermelon falling off a phone pole and catching them. Um, not the fastest of raptors and not the most agile. So uh, ferruginous hawks are also a member of this uh, family, the Budios, as well as the red-shouldered hawk. Now the Budios, uh, and again, if you're watching in other countries other than the United States, the term buzzard and the term Budio are synonymous. Americans we screwed that up in our own localized vocabulary and we use the term buzzard to mean vulture, which is completely incorrect. But a buzzard and a bootio are the same thing, okay? So buzzards or bootios in almost every other part of the world traditionally was viewed as a less desirable uh, choice for a falconry bird, for a hunting bird, because they were viewed as slow, they were viewed as lethargic, they were viewed as not very gamey, and most of the time you see them hunting rodents. It's like, well, I don't want a mouse killer. I want a, a falcon that will catch a grouse or a, a goshawk that will catch a pheasant or a rabbit. And that was sort of the understandable attitude, especially when falconry was much more in the old days about actually providing a meal for your family, not just a, a hobby or a sport on the side. So that's an understandable view. But again, this is one of the things where uh, falconers in America are like, well, we've heard of falconry in other countries. Let's try out what's available. Red-tailed hawk. Oh, that's close by. I'll get one of those. Early falconers in the early 1900s proved, uh, wait a minute, a red-tailed hawk may in the wild be a bit lethargic and easygoing, a lot of gliding, a lot of soaring, but with proper training and proper weight management and proper exercise, they're wonderful hunters. Red-tailed hawks uh, in many states have been proven as uh, agile, um, fast squirrel hawkers that would dive through the trees, really dense trees, and catch, you know, big old bushy-tailed uh, tree squirrels. Pretty impressive to watch. And uh, they've been used to hunt cottontail rabbits, as well as here in the West, jackrabbits. I'm always amazed by it. Eastern red tails are bigger, typically, than the Western red tails. But we have these giant jackrabbits here in the West, and we use our much smaller red-tailed hawks to hunt these much larger rabbits. So it's kind of a misplacement of size, but that and and it's amazing to watch a what would a wild red tail may look lethargic, and then you see oh well we're taking this trained red tail and catching a jackrabbit may chase for several hundred yards. 
a good fit bird. And a jackrabbit is an impressive game animal. And so a bird that seemingly has attributes that make it not uh, up to par for the needs for a hunting bird, given effort, given a fair chance, given proper weight management and exercise, proved to be amazing. Now, because that, before we're jumping into red-shouldered hawks, let's take a look at red-tailed hawks because they actually teach us something about red shoulders. The range of red-tailed hawks is expansive. Look at the map and you see, wow, they live in states that are open prairie, states that are mountains, states that are desert, states that are hardwood forest, states that are softwood forests, and even into the tropics, from the tundra to the tropics. So the red-tailed hawk is an extremely adaptable bird. It is true that red-tailed hawks uh, often are targeting rodents, but, you know, reptiles, birds, waterfowl, whatever, whatever they can find within their range, uh, a lot of big cities have red-tailed hawks that almost exclusively hunt pigeons. So it's an adaptable species that's able to take on a large amount of prey. Now take a look at the range map of the red-shouldered hawk. It's very different. Now red-shouldered hawk is a bootio. Red-shouldered hawk is one of these soaring hawks, right? That's like, oh, I should be sitting in a tree, at least according to definitions, looking around, looking for food. But when you look at the map, look at where it lives. Mostly on the northeastern, eastern, and southeastern part of the country. Now that's going all the way up into very cold territory, all the way into the tropics. And seemingly randomly, also in California. It's like, uh, why is there no connection there? And I'll tell you the answer in a second. Um, but they're, they're in a very weird range from, from tropical to tundra, but not in the open country. Now, yes, they can hunt a farm field, but this should be a clue. Everywhere they live is fairly forested, but not uh, not typically fir, pine, or you know conifer forests. They're typically in in um, in hardwood forests. You know maples and oaks, and th these are the kind of trees that they want to live in that are often denser and are deciduous. So in the wintertime, they're losing their leaves in some areas. This is important to understanding what this bird is and how this bird operates. Because it is true that red tails live in these same regions and will, as I mentioned with squirrel hawking, are capable of diving through fairly dense trees. But the red-shouldered hawk is very much a uh, occipiter version of a bootio. Now the occipiters, if you're not familiar with them, like in America, are the goss hawk and the cooper's hawk and the sharp shinned hawk. All three of these birds have very short rounded wings and long oversized tails. The shorter wings allow them to dodge through branches much easier without breaking a feather and the longer tail makes them more maneuverable. Well, red shouldered hawks have a build much more like that of an occipiter. So even though they are a bootio, they're built for a more occipitrine way of life. They're built for more agility. They're built to live in denser forests. And to some degree, they have to compete with red tails. But in other ways, they're a bit more generalized. Where a red tail will say, this is my area. I'm hunting these fields. These are my fields. These are my rodent plots that I'm going to hunt. Where red-shouldered hawks are more in the fray. They're, they're out in the denser forests instead of always sitting on the edge. Again, they will eat rodents. But red-shouldered hawks um, are like if you crossed a red-tailed hawk and a goss hawk and a caracara. It seems a bit strange. Caracaras are the ground dwellers that hunt a lot of uh, invertebrates and amphibians and lizards and stuff. And that's really kind of, they fit that role. Their abilities are very strange. When you watch them fly, when you watch a red-shouldered hawk fly, it's very different than a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks soar and glide and then they'll flap, flap. Now, of course, one that's hunting will, voo, 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 but, but a regular red tail is just, right? A red-shouldered hawk flying casually has a much more rapid wing beat. It's much more like an occipiter. Uh, I live in Utah where we aren't supposed to have them. And every three or four years, I will see one here. And every time I'm like, what? Why is there a goshawk on a farm? 
you know, just like an open country. And then because I, I see the wing beat and I'll think it's a goshawk or a large Cooper's hawk. And then I'm like, oh, wait, that's a, oh, that's a red shouldered hawk. They are capable of going much faster. Now, remember, if you live in an area where you have them and you see one and they seem fast, that is a lethargic, well-fed bird that isn't exercised. It isn't having any weight management applied. And so it's not motivated to fly and show you its top speed. And even not showing you its top speed, they are much faster, more agile, and more nimble than a red-tailed hawk. Now, these forests they live in, they will hunt oh, just an odd mix. They will hunt snakes and frogs and lizards and all the rodents, but they hunt birds. They'll hunt large insects. They'll hunt whatever seems to come available. And the forests that they live in are incredibly productive. The, the biodiversity available is just through the roof. And why make your life more challenging? You know, a falconer might say, oh, well, they're not as spirited. They're not chasing after this or that. And they, Rrr. well, you know what? Why? It's just kind of like getting mad at a bald eagle or a golden eagle for eating a fresh roadkill. What are they, a vulture? It's like, no, that's a fresh, easy, free meal that they don't have to kill. Take advantage of it. And same thing, where red tails command a bit more of the more open range, these red shoulders are like, well, we're going to scoot in a little bit from and be in the denser forest. And ha if you keep going down into the tropics, then red-shouldered hawks really get replaced in their ecological niche with members of the kite family, who the same thing is like, oh, I could be really gamey, but instead I'm going to go after whatever. Here's a, here's a snail. Here's a lizard. Here's a rat. Here's a snake. Here's a frog. Uh, red-shouldered hawks will often, especially in the southern part, southern part of their range, are going after these species. Because of that, they spend a lot of time willing to be on the ground and in the water. They love to play in the water. They love to hunt in the water. Oh, there's a crayfish. Oh, there's a garter snake. Oh, there's a tadpole. They're willing to do that. And they have much longer legs than other Budios do for, for their size, uh, which again is uh, almost almost getting into the range of like member, like a Harris hawk. And so they can be very quick and nimble on the ground. Um, my favorite, I, I, I've seen red-shouldered hawks from, I, I've seen them in Canada, and they uh, they were all poofed up, and poof, they didn't look nimble at all. And I knew, well, you're poofed up, but they just looked like, I am a watermelon, don't make me move, it's cold. And then another, you know, I remember seeing them in Florida, and they all, they look just like red goshawks. They just look like, Meh. and it's like, wow, this is such a cool species. One of my favorite things I ever saw that showed showcased the gaminess was I don't know what species of lizard it was, but I was in Florida. I was actually at um, I was at Disney World, and I was sitting there in their Animal Kingdom, and I'm sitting there just eating some breakfast and and watching all the other wild birds that came into this little pond. And all of a sudden, I see a red-shouldered hawk. It was used to people because it's Disney World, and it goes and it lands on the bars right by me. I'm like. Oh, and I tried to get my camera out and film it, and all I got was blurry footage of this, and it's looking on the hunt. This was in January. It was that surprisingly cold. So anywhere the sun was facing south, I noticed lizards started to go on the trees and in the, where the sun was, and this red shoulder hawk's looking and bobbing, and, and all of a sudden it sees one, and it launches off, and it goes, and this lizard jumps off a tree, just like a squirrel, onto a neighboring palm tree and I watched and it just it came right at and it went, went, dodged the tree and went right up to the palm tree it was just like an occipiter Doo -doo -doo. and it grabbed where all the dead leaves and material came down on the palm tree and it got and it was hanging upside down flapping it had the lizard but it had all this palm material as well and finally <laughs> ripped it off and flew off with this huge section of palm tree and this was a little male and it, I'm like you're carrying off more palm tree than you are lizard there buddy it was so neat to see the agility and the tenacity to go after something now we're not hunting little lizards in falconry i get it but let's be honest here red-tailed hawks mostly hunt mice and voles are you hunting mice with your red-tailed hawk probably not so the point is i agree that a red-tailed hawk is it has more application in the sport of falconry but it's only able to be a good game hawk because good falconers are putting forth the effort 
exercising them and doing proper weight management and introducing them properly to prey like jackrabbits, squirrels, and, and cottontails to have them be successful. And people are not doing that with red-shouldered hawks. That's a very important distinction. Now, before I jump into the falconry part, uh, I want to tell you something that I think is so neat that people just never see. Remember I mentioned earlier, you look at the, uh, you look at the red-tailed hawk map, and it's everywhere. You look at the red-shouldered hawk map, and it's like northeastern, eastern, southeastern United States, and, and, and a little bit of northeastern Mexico, and California. Okay, you see that. And it's like, well, where's the connection? I'll show you the connection. It's a surprising one. You look at the range map of the gray hawk, and it connects the dots. Gray hawks are a species that are, are almost unknown to falconry, and I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we were captive breeding them and seeing what they were able to be. Gray hawks live in these uh, more southern and more arid regions, and they are genetically the offshoot of the red-shouldered hawk. So they're basically a Sonoran Mojave uh, version of a red-shouldered hawk. And so, in fact, I always tell people, like, if you don't see it, just start looking at pictures of uh, red-shouldered hawks, but switch switch your camera to black and white, and you'll be like, oh, it's a gray hawk. Like the bandings and markings, especially the tail, what the babies look like. You, you have the temperate to tropical version of this species, and the, the uh, they're close enough genetically that a case could be made that they are the same species, just different subspecies. But they're, they're so different in, in coloration even though their markings and molts are the same. They're so different in coloration and the region they live in that it's like we just, people hardly ever make that connection. And yet genetically, they are they are like that. And so who knows how, when, where, what, but you have them over here, you have them over here, and this in-between is connected by the gray hawk, which you could just call the uh, Mexican red-shouldered hawk, in, in my opinion. I mean, that's, I know that's just, my views on taxonomy, but I think that's kind of an interesting connection there. And, uh, and, and they're filling the same roles. They're, okay, I'm mostly going to be in, oh, I'm in a cottonwood forest where there's water in the Mojave and Sonoran deserts. Okay, I'm, in, I'm by these water where there are frogs, where there are snakes, where there are lizards, where there are tadpoles, where there are crayfish in the middle of the desert. Greyhawk is hunting that exact same ecological niche that's a microbiome only along riparian corridors that have cottonwood trees in the extreme deserts of, uh, of Mexico and the extreme southern United States. So I, I love them. They're so exciting. Uh, but back to the red-shouldered hawks. I want to talk a little bit about them in falconry and pros and cons to them. A lot of people will say, well, they're small. So is a kestrel. That doesn't stop us from hunting with them. Uh, size, you know, Yoda says, size matters not if you want to go that route. I think it's funny that a big female red-shouldered hawk is larger than a big male goshawk. And I've never had a hard time taking down full-size black-tailed jackrabbits with a male goshawk. So you've got this little male goshawk that can do it but you're saying size-wise a female red-shouldered can. It doesn't add up. Uh, it might be a, a, a bit of a challenge to, to manhandle them, but that's you rush in and help them out. So yes, that's a legitimate point to say. They're a bit smaller than red tails. I agree. If you took a well-trained red tail and a well-trained red-shouldered, red tail's going to have probably a lot easier time tackling a big jackrabbit. But if you're worried about that, the argument is always made for cottontails. And mammal-wise, I think this is where the true uh, ability of a red shoulder could lie. Uh, and one of the biggest problems I see is a lot of the hawking styles of... Wait, okay, let me, let me start this over. Where red-shouldered hawks live, the falconers who live there justifiably say, hey, the style of falconry we want to do is better suited with the red tail. So why on earth would I get a red-shouldered hawk if the style of falconry I want to do, a red tail is better suited for? I agree. Totally agree. But my point is, if a person in a different region, 
say my area here in Utah, uh, we might find a better use for that type of species. And a cotton, jackrabbits potentially, but cottontail more so. Uh, I live in very open country where we have mountains as well, but mostly we're hunting out in the sagebrush country out in our great western deserts. And in these open areas, there's these big gaps. There's not trees. And so our usually our best option is direct pursuit flights, which requires a level of fitness that you might not always have to have if you are in an eastern hardwood forest. Many eastern falconers have amazing success where they have trees alongside fields and farms and they just have their red tail go up to a tree follow along tree to tree to tree and then when you flush up a rabbit they dive down and catch him very successful technique wonderful way to practice a sport uh, but if you're in open country that extra speed and that extra maneuverability that red-shouldered hawks are capable of could be a great way to bridge that gap especially on cottontails which are much smaller than red-tailed hawks uh, I'm sorry, cottontails that are much smaller than jackrabbits. A lot of our cottontails don't run. They they rush for cover here in the West. I Back East, you know, things are different. You might go into a brush pile or whatever, but a lot of times we know, okay, this is the hillside where the cottontails are, and you have to kind of get the drop on them um, and sneak up on them and then phew, jump up and try. And goshawks and harrisocks usually do pretty good at that, but redtails can have a bit of a hard time here in the West which is ridiculous that, oh, I'll chase a jackrabbit for 100 yards, and yet, you know, 10 yards out, there was a cottontail, and it went into a hole before I could get it. And that little bit of extra speed afforded by a red-shouldered hawk certainly has the potential to bridge that gap and make them a more effective cottontail hunter. Now, I, I, I acknowledge that as a Western falconer, I'm not looking for necessarily, oh, what, it, what can I just hunt cottontails with? I'm looking for... Hey, whatever rabbit I flush that's in season, I want a bird that can catch it. But I'm still pointing out that is a capability. And if a person is passionate about the species, what's the harm in saying, hey, go ahead, put your effort, exercise them, get them fit, and go after cottontails. As far as their grip, people say, oh, their, their grip isn't enough for a rabbit. I've been footed by a rehab red shoulder, and it had much more of a grip than when I've been footed by rehab and falconry male goshawks. So if a male goshawk can hold on to a jackrabbit, I there's you can't convince me that a, a that a big female uh, red shoulder would have any problem binding and holding on to a rabbit if it was trained to do so and wanted to. They can do it. They're capable of it. I already mentioned their wing beat is much faster. Their tail is much longer proportionately than a red tail for their size. And so you have that agility and that nimbleness. And I genuinely believe that this is a species that under right circumstances could be used to go after quail. Maybe best in conjunction with a dog that can, you know, sniff them out and be on point so that the bird's ready. But I think off the fist hawking, uh, going after quail and cottontail rabbits with a red-shouldered hawk definitely has merit and shouldn't be tossed out just because it's unfamiliar or new. The same thing, the one that I would love to try if I ever get a red-shouldered hawk, I love to do hillside chucker partridge hunting from the hill down. We have these little pockets of chucker, uh, chucker partridge in the deserts of Utah. And I love to be on the hillside with a bird and they'll flush, you know, just 10 feet downhill from you. And, and I would love to just have a red-shouldered hawk to try that out. Because again, if this is a goshawk in its abilities and this is a red-tailed hawk and, and if you say, oh, a Harris hawk is maybe somewhere in here, then I put a red-shouldered hawk somewhere in here. Harris hawks are faster. They're more agile than a red tail. Um, but I also say a red-shouldered hawk is faster and more agile than a red-tailed hawk. I think it's important to keep an open mind. And I think it's really good to pioneer new ideas. If a person is passionate about a species, and if they're going out hunting, even if it's harder, you're justified to be like, you know, that'd be a lot easier if you got this other bird. And you'd be correct. But let a person fly what they're passionate about. Probably my absolute favorite falcon, and I will do a, do a video on them in the coming weeks, is the Lanner Falcon. 
I am obsessed with them. I love them with all of my heart. They are gorgeous, and they have such a rich history genetically um, as far as how many species branched off from them, but also their tie into ancient Egypt. And how strange that from that they have a range covering the Mediterranean and traditionally used in medieval Europe. And yet they are the Horus of ancient Egypt. And uh, you, you watch the videos of them in, in extreme South Africa, hunting sand grouse at the watering holes. And it's like, whoa, just it's a, it's a, a beautiful spectacle of nature watching lanner falcon do their little thing in the wild. And I love them so much. They're kind of a dumpy falconry bird. A lot of bird shows use them for, for education because they can handle the heat. They have a low wing loading. They're usually pretty loyal. So doing a good lure stooping demonstration and then the audience, oh, wow, oh. And then you might be thinking, yeah, but I wish I was flying my peregrine on a, on a grouse instead. Uh, that's okay. I'm allowed to be like, I love lanner falcons. And I will happily acknowledge that a peregrine falcon is a much more effective hunting bird than a lanner falcon. However, if I say, you know what, I love lanterns, I'm going to fly one because I love them. I'm taking them out hunting, I won't catch as much game as you will with your peregrine. But boy, the smile on my face, I'm going to be grinning ear to ear because I'm, ooh, I'm hunting an, an actual lanner falcon. It's about passion. Uh, falconry is many things to many people. It is, uh, it's not just a way to get food. It's, it's so many things. And le let's take a little more of a philosophical approach here. Life is short. Life is a gift and the time we have is a gift. And having the opportunity to train a wild bird and hunt with it and see it go fly totally free and come back and have that strange partnership, that strange alliance is so special and so fulfilling so rewarding so hard and if a person just really loves a species why shoot down their dream and if a person can take a red-shouldered hawk and put in the proper time uh, the proper weight management and the proper exercise and introduction to prey why not why not say hey good luck to you you'd have more luck with a red tail a harris or a goshawk, but I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you have a lot of success in the field. Why not have that kind of an attitude? That's my attitude about it. I ha again, since I have not personally hunted them, and I would do anything for the chance, it's it's one of my bucket list species that I just think it'll be a lot of fun to kind of see what can you try out in unusual circumstances. But my, here's a recommendation. If you're thinking about it and you you have the proper permits and you live in a state where you can legally pull a wild one, I do not recommend pulling a baby. Most booty, well, every booty, every buzzard that I've ever dealt with and seen other people dealt with, if they are imprinted even properly, you run into a lot of behavioral issues. Uh, so the two recommendations would be either to trap a first year bird that has totally left the nest area or what we call kind of a family bird, which is a bird that has been raised all the way up to where now it's learning to fly and it's in its first few days of flying and the parents are in the process of ditching the babies and being like, okay, you need to start finding your own food now. That time, if you can trap one at that age, uh, you have to introduce them to game very quickly. But those would be my two recommendations. That's recommendations for somebody who has not uh, hunted one, but just the rules of uh, training a bootio of any kind, those would be your best recommendations for entering them on prey. And again, I genuinely believe that they could be wonderful uh, cocktail hunters, and I think off the fist or from a tea perch in more Western hunting styles of, hey, we're more open country instead of waiting for them to come from a tree. These closer flash and dash, more occipiter like hunts really have a lot of potential. And I know people who have done it over the years, and I think it's wonderful. I would love to see more of that. Um, if you have hunted them, please, by all means, um, put comments down below so people can read about your experiences. Um, and again, if I am ever able to get a red-shouldered hawk, I will happily document the whole training and hunting experience. Uh, if you have other concerns that uh, you've worked with uh, red shoulders and there's concerns that I haven't uh, known and, or forgot to bring up, please put them down below as well. It's definitely worthwhile. Um, but again, I've, I've hunted with strange things. I've hunted with harriers. 
uh, I pushed to legalize rough-legged hawks being used in Utah because I've hunted with them and had success with the females on jackrabbits. Way easier with the red tail, but I love rough-legged hawks. So every few years, it's fun to trap one, train one, and for the winter, hunt jackrabbits in the coldest months of the year and then set them free in the spring to move forward. Uh, I know I've seen followed people online who have had success with Swainson's hawks, and I've always been a naysayer about Swainson's hawks. I'm like, why would you do that? Rad little feed there. Blah, blah, blah. And then <clears throat> people have gone out and and just torn it up and just had amazing experience hunting rabbits with swains and hawks. So again, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water. And if good falconers are putting effort into red-shouldered hawks because it's a species they're passionate about, then in my mind, there's nothing to stop them from being successful game hawks. They, I, they, they don't have as broad of application as a red tail or a Harris. But in a narrower realm of application, they have all the potential to be incredibly successful bird. So I hope this discussion doesn't ruffle too many feathers. No pun intended. I hope you enjoyed uh, the subject. Uh, let me know down below what other videos you would like me to make. And please hit subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps me build this channel. And as always, happy hawking. <laughs>